Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, that was so loud, I nearly deafened myself. Um, I'm Paul Baxich, uh, Managing Director of Matty Media Limited, a consultancy company mainly advising universities who are bewildered about online learning. Don't all rush up to me at once afterwards, form an orderly queue. Anyway, this, this pre these presentations will help you a lot in terms of, of, uh, of certainly in the higher education space and similar spaces in terms of uh, developing strategies, because it's all about strategy. Uh, and that's, just, that's just not just from strategy textbooks, that's worth remembering. We've got three excellent speakers, and we're going to start with Ilona Buchum from Beuth University of Applied Sciences here in Berlin, so if you haven't traveled too far, uh, who is a professor for media and communications at the university, has done, I've known her for some time, she's done lots and lots of exciting uh, projects, and um, she's going to tell us about, uh, no doubt refer to her particular digital future project at your university. Okay, over to you, Alona. Okay, thank you for the introduction and um, hello everyone. This room is really great and huge. <laughs> and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, so I'm going to present to you the project that has already, that is already finished, a project that we have run at uh, my university, uh, Boyd University of Applied Sciences here in Berlin. And it's called Digital, or it was called Digital Future. The project was one of the winner projects in, an, uh, in a federal competition for digital strategies in higher education. That, that uh, competition was run by Stifterverband, which is an association of um, um, a foundation, basically association of, of founders in Germany and Heinz Nixdorf Stiftung. And uh, it was funded for two and a half years. And we were lucky enough to get this funding to engage only or use two and a half years to engage only in strategy development. So we, we're really only focusing on strategy development and I'm going to present to you the process and, to, and the results of this. Um, very shortly about you, our university so that you also have some background information. It's a university of applied sciences. We have about uh, 13,000 students, uh, 300 professors more or less and 600 lecturers, eight departments, 70 uh, master and bachelor programs. And we are also a member uh, in the virtual university of applied sciences in Germany, which is called uh, VH, v VFH. Um, and as you can see, we have a lot of courses that are related to engineering and technology. So you see this uh, uh, robot, for instance, that is developed in one of the labs and was actually uh, even starring in a, in a play, in an opera. And, but we also have some, some study programs that take uh, place outside. So very different study programs, like, for instance, landscaping and gardening or uh, garden engineering, um, very, very different, very diverse offers uh, for our students. Um, also, our students are diverse. Uh, we have, for instance, many students who come from families that don't have any academic background. We have many students that do not have not followed the typical way um, from high school to higher education, but maybe did vocational training before. We have students with migration background, students that have children and many international students, of course. So um, why I'm presenting this is that the reason for us to start developing the strategy at Boyd University was also to uh, develop a strategy that would cater for all these different diverse programs and diverse groups of students that we have. Uh, the strategy that we have developed is also part of the competency center or the largest strategy that we have at the university and uh, it's called city of the future that's why our project is called digital future so to sort of link to the largest strategy we have three different clusters it's about living in the city infrastructures for the city and urban technologies i will not go into detail into this and this uh, digital future strategy is only uh, focusing on using digital media in teaching or in, in, um, in education, basically, in higher education. So we also have other strategies or develop other strategies for research, for instance, for library, uh, open access, also for the communication and, and administration, like um, just regular uh, strategy related to the campus management. Um, so this is a very specific strategy that we have developed. And also what we have been trying to do is sort of um, start the second leap of innovation, as we call it. So, you know, like there was this wave of e-learning in the 1990s, 
beginning, yeah, end of, of 1990s, we also have had this. We have developed online online study programs. We have become part of the online of the universe, um, uh, association of virtual universities. So we have run those courses very successfully. But as far as just regular learning and teaching on campus, face-to-face -face is concerned, this has been very traditional. So our focus has been on how we can make the second innovation leap, how can we um, introduce more or change the, um, the way that students are taught in just regular on-campus study programs. Um, so this is how we started. We started in 2015 and ended 2017. We have developed the strategy in a few milestones and the, uh, the general idea was that because the, the university is so diverse and the offer is so diverse, we started with different departments. So we started bottom up and every department was invited to develop their own strategy. And this was like taking place in different milestones in different waves. So we started with first two departments and the two other departments um, started uh, or joined this process. And then we had eight departments or eight departments in the end. And each basically each department developed their own first in the first stage, their own um, specific strategy. Once this was done, um, we uh, started a digital commission and this digital commission included the people the, from the departments that were involved in the strategy development at the departmental level before. And these people, because they already had um, the experience, they started developing the university strategy. So this is how we followed from the bottom up to sort of top down level. We came first from the departmental strategies and then we had, we established the university strategy. Um, we also had a teacher training series um, throughout this process and a design-based research where we basically were developing the way the different departments were developing their strategies, how they coped with those, how they communicated, how they basically did the entire um, uh, process. And we also were asking students and, and teachers at the university about how they're using media, how they want, what, what sort of change they wish, and um, their ideas for the strategies at the different levels. Uh, we also set some strategic goals for the strategy development. So we always said we have to have some common guiding principles. And that's why we said when we want to apply digital media in teaching, we, ha we want to enhance didact or didactical quality. We also want to support student diversity. And we also want to prepare students for the future field or for the connected work, world of work. So these were the three goals that were strategic goals and each department basically took those goals and operationalized them in their own way. So they were all, all departments were free to say what didactics, qualities, uh, student diversity and future of work really means to us and then they define those goals in their own way. We have also developed a competency-based student lifeline to also guide this entire process on a concept basically that was gui guiding the strategy development. Um, because a lot of times student cycle models are very administrative, so you're, more, you're thinking like the student enrolls and then they go through a cycle, but it's more from an um, administrative perspective and we were trying to have a more competency-based uh, look at this. So we basically thought about starting with some basic digital competencies and increasing the range, increasing the complexity of those uh, competencies while the, um, as, the stud as students progress at the university and also preparing students for lifelong le learning. We have also applied an open innovation approach. So we were cooperating with different universities in Germany and uh, with, um, for instance, an institute for teacher training and also inside the university, it was important for us to cooperate across the departments, but also with different labs, with researchers, with administration. So basically um, trying to cooperate with all the different people that would probably normally also not be included in the strategy development. Our design-based research, I'm not going to go into detail into this, was also like we saw a parallel development in the project and we have had very interesting results from this. They have not been published yet, but we have a lot of data on how the strategies are developed at the, at the university level and also um, what students, for instance, think about digital media. This is not always uh, digital media in teaching or in, in studying learning and this is not always 
or very positive and all enhancing. So for instance, because our university is rather small and applied oriented, students have always um, um, expressed their concerns that if we use too much media, then they will be not, maybe not direct contact with the lecturers, what they really value, and they would like to keep this character, for instance, of, of studies at the University of, of Applied Sciences. So we have had some interesting insights from this research. So what, what has happened in this process is that we um, created some new structures. So now in every, every department has its own digital, digitalization representative and a strategy team. Um, so like you can see here, we have eight departments and every department has a professor or, a, or two professors sometimes who um, deal with the digital media questions and also have a team that sometimes is composed also of students and, and sometimes even alumni and um, um, lecturers, so more or less representing different stakeholders. And we have also um, established a digitalization commission at the university level, um, which is this blue line like above. So, uh, uh, at the bottom line, you see the different departments and then there's the Digitalization Commission, which is basically deciding about um, university level issues, like, for instance, investing in different projects or um, um, broadening the infrastructure related to the university, but not the department itself. So we have created a new structure to help us um, strategically and um, strategically address the questions of digital uh, change in on-campus teaching, and um, yes, that was that was it. I hope I <laughs> I kept my 15 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much. If you yeah have more Very questions. <laughs> so, thank you to Elona for keeping well to time. In fact, it gives us more time for questions. Do do we have a roaming roaming mic in in the room or? Or what? What's the procedure for this room? Anyway, who would like to ask a question? Perhaps in the first few rows where I can actually see you. There's one, right? Yes, please. There's the mic coming to you. Please. Uh, my name is uh, Wilfred Rubens. Uh, what I, I, the question I have uh, is that uh, you had a, a parallel project of a teacher professionalization. Wasn't it uh, part of the department strate strategies uh, or uh, uh, what was the connection between the, the parallel teacher strategy and these uh, department uh, strategies? Uh, we started, uh, so we started with research and the research showed that teachers, our teachers still wanted to learn more about using digital media. So that was the triggering point basically to say, okay, we need to do something on top more than we're doing already because we can send our teachers, for instance, to this institute that we have in Berlin for higher education didactics, but our teachers wanted to do more. So that's why we started with a teacher training series for every, uh, basically it was across departments. And then um, we had different professors coming there and we always said, you know, when you come, once, you come, once you come to this training, you are like a mul multiplicator or you are a multiplier. I don't know what you say in English. <laughs> yeah, you sort of, yeah, you have, to, you have to disseminate this in your own department. So like you come here, you learn something and please disseminate it, give your knowledge further. And then in the second phase, when we started developing the university strategy, um, we also heard from colleagues, okay, so, so this was good, but now we would like to have some more uh, training in our own departments that is more suited to our needs and also more where we can exchange more with the colleagues within departments. So then we started the second wave where we could, ha we had more workshops at the departmental level. So like very targeted toward their own needs. Thank you. Let's, let's try a question over this side. I've invented a special device called my hand, which allows me to see into the back of the room. So who have we got over this side of the room, please? Another one yeah. on this side. I, let's give this, I'm trying to give each side a chance, but there's, there's one there, and then we'll come back to this side. Yes. And the, we'd like to have the people in the back as well as the front given a chance too. We're trying to be very democratic. Yes, uh, my Please. name is Kirsten Ringard, and uh, I would like to ask, do you see any changes in the course construction today that has changed uh, through this new process and strategy? 
Yes, so we, we will ha still have to do more research to, to have like more representative and qualitative data, but um, a lot has changed in terms of talking about using digital media because of the, just because of the communication, the workshops and everything. I think uh, teachers that probably before never considered or like were not interested in, in, in different topics around using digital media started to asking and like coming to, you know, to workshops and, and um, applying some things. So the interest is there and we will have to wait, you know, until, so like we also have projects, for instance, that have started because of this, so like spin off things. And um, the recent interesting thing is that we have also started uh, a, a project, um, another project, which gives each department an opportunity to apply with their own project to be supported from the university money to um, uh, apply digital media in teaching. So like very much targeted also towards um, needs in different departments, something that we didn't have before, for instance. So I think this will also be another trigger to, to have more of digital media or new concepts with digital media in, in on-campus programs. Okay, fine. We've got time for another question. Let's try the, this side at the back and then we'll come to the front again. I can't see anyone at the back, so the front has it, please. My name is Caroline van der Molen from Saxion University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands. I have a question about the distinct distinction between the teacher training series and the design-based training, because I would assume that the design-based training uh, is the um, uh, teacher training, because what else do you teach the, the, the teachers? Ah, no, no. It was the, so the, first, the, the second tier was teacher training and the last one was design-based research. Oh, research. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we have done research about how the strategies Sorry. are developed and just, you know, yeah. parallel to the developments we were observing and asking, yeah. doing interviews and surveys. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, time for one more quick question from anywhere. First hand up. Okay, there we are, up there, please. This will be the last question for Ilona, but we have time at the end for, for more discussion. Hi, I'm Lisa Erbeck from Denmark, <laughs> and uh, I'd like to know with the, uh, with the strategy that you started on a department level, and you then moved on to a, st uh, a university strategic level, did you see any um, situations where there were like conflicts between what one department wanted rather than another? Mm -mm. No, not at all, because we also said, so the, 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 uni the departmental strategies, they are still there. So for instance, what we have also achieved is that on the website of every department, we have the strategy paper. And this is the, basically the documentation of the strategy that the department developed and they keep them. So they don't lose them just only because we move to the uh, umbrella strategy of the university. So the umbrella strategy of the university takes into consideration the, uh, the departmental strategies, but does not um, get rid of them because of the other ones. So that we have them in parallel, so to say. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, now we will hand over, to, let's uh, we'll have another round of applause for uh, this, the speaker and the questions. You're gonna sit here, right? Okay, I'll hand over to Professor Jilly Salmon, who's uh, uh, a stalwart of online educa <laughs> and uh, is now at uh, the University of Liverpool Business School as a professor, but she spent uh, the last few years in senior positions in Australia at three institutions as Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Western Australia, that's basically Vice Rector for those who understand that terminology better, always involved in learning transformation, um, and she's called this talk Education the Last Bastion of what? No, not you'll really <laughs> ask or find out. Thank you very much, Julie. Okay. Um, so, um, I'm going to talk about, if you want to make strategy, I suggest you do two things first. Purely based on experience, I don't think you'll find it in any of the strategy textbooks. But if you have a look at um, all the strategies that have gone before you, you usually find not all of them get implemented. Has that been your experience? Mm. I'm sure that's not going to happen to yours because the bottom-up approach sounds fantastic to me. But just in case any others are worried about that, I thought I'd start my talk with saying, you do a bit of bug listing. Try and understand 
you know, the environment in which you're making strategy before you make it. And I'm also going to suggest to you that our very special environment, and I know most about higher education, but I think some of what I'm going to say may apply to other forms of education too. Okay? Um, so, I'm going to explain, Paul, who I think it, the last bastion is. So, uh, Can we have slide two, please? So, just to remind you, I think we're pretty much all here because we know we're operating in a very uncertain future. And most of us don't feel we're in a great deal of control. So what we strategize internally really needs to be a great response, not only to what is outside our walls, but also is coming towards us in the future. Would you agree with that? So I'm sort of kind of looking at what's going on in our environments as I move towards making strategy. So if we have the next slide. Um, this is a bas bastion, okay? Do you recognize it? Any students of history or architecture in the audience? I'm lucky then, so. <laughs> so I'd like to consider and I'd like you to reflect on the term bastion. It is bastion, I'm saying, by the way. Um, bastions are, are built in the line of a wall of fortification to allow defensive fire in several directions and therefore repel attacking forces and protect those within the stronghold, who may, by the way, be under siege. So for most of us, bastions conjure up visions of fortresses that are protected and defended. And the bit of Latin there means always the same. Any clues now why I'm using this metaphor today? Is this beginning to sound just a little bit familiar to those working in higher education? Anyone think yes? Okay. The term bastion, of course, is also used as a metaphor for an institution, a place, or a person determined to maintain a principle, an attitude, or an activity, and consequently not to change. And it may be valid, of course. But if you strategize without looking at that, then you're bound to be disappointed. So we can apply the metaphor of bastions to organizations to suggest some reluctance to embrace the advance of change and transformation. The arrangements may protect existing people and preserve established ways of doing everything that has been valued usually over a long period of time, well rehearsed, well practiced, and thus embedded in the cultural norms of the organization. And no strategy, however smart, will come along and change that unless you engage from the bottom up in just the way you heard just now in my view. Now, these bastions, if you're up there, you will see the forces for change coming. And actually, what most people do is then develop ways of denying or resisting that onslaught. And the energy is thus put into defense rather than development. Does it still sound familiar? So this often leads to a form of siege. Siege is are uh, costly, lengthy, and often actually have negative consequences for both sides in the battle. Well-intentioned people frequently hunker down within the institution while their more nimble competitors reach out with purpose to the outside world. So can we go on to the next slide, please? I'd like to briefly explore with you the wicked problem 
our special higher educations present to us and their role in the complex adaptive systems that go up to make our world and influence directly the kind of strategies that we should be making. And also, why I think that the bastions in higher education may be some of the last standing against the force majeure of digitalization across many sectors, including our own. Of course, I know that some suggest that digital is inherently inhuman and bad, but most people, and probably all of us here today, recognize that it can and should bring amazing advantages to education if only we can get the strategies past the bastion. Come with the next slide, please, Daniel. Thank you. All across the globe, sectors are transforming based on external pressures. For example, one big force of transformation is, of course, digital technology. And it has been rapidly shifting in nearly every other sector and industry from a driver of efficiency to an enabler of fundamental innovation. The digital world has moved now from transforming the back office to transforming customer experiences. And that's where I think our strategies need to move to. Someone, or maybe multiple somethings, I think of them as dragons myself, demolish the bastions from the inside out in most industries, or perhaps instead use them to engage the forces heading their way, open the doors, created new visions, new purposes, new strategies, new tactics. So for me, it seems very, very mysterious that the higher education sector has not done this. Do you think it's mysterious? After all, we have the lion's share of the best thinkers, the scientists, and the most creative people on the planet inside our walls. We do. So it doesn't make sense to me. But over the years, there have been many trends, indeed conflicting and competing forces, directly impacting on our universities. And I think that that's what's given us this very great difficulty of creating strategy that works and enables us to fully take our proper role, and that is creating unimagined futures rather than resisting them. So I like to deconstruct the components that go to make up past, present, and future education. Um, I think we have the next slide. Thanks. You'll see this on my website. I won't go through it now because it will take too long. But if any of you like to have a look at where we've been before you do your strategy for the future, you may find some help from this particular diagram. Um, it's on my website and it's freely available. Um, and so... Maybe you think that innovation in all its forms would be the key strategic platform on which to build a successful engagement with these myriad of forces. Instead of building the walls of the bastion even higher, I would like to do that. Well, there are many calls from transformation from our stakeholders, not the least, of course, from our students and their future employers. But in universities at the moment, on the whole, we do not sufficiently and collectively attend to these forces pressing on the walls of our bastions because we are too busy responding to them in our time-honoured ways. We see normative behaviours learned from our past experiences and histories. We do see the challenges, but then we apply our existing mental models 
frames of reference, strong espoused values to solve them. That's what we do, and we're pretty good at it too. Then a disruptive force comes along, say, like a company offering massive open online courses, and it leaves the gap to take a hold because it offers a product to people who aren't otherwise being served by the core education that universities have always offered for 1,000 years. So, um, can we have the next slide, please? So, this is the challenge. What can be done to chip away at those bastions? I do not think the overall purpose of your strategy needs to change. You do not have to demolish your existing values, but you do have to totally change the way you deliver them. And you need to look at those people coming your way and at the other sectors and engage with them in order to get a meaningful strategy. So here's my tips at fighting those people coming towards you. First, we really do need a new sense of purpose. At the present, we're all becoming more global, producing work-ready students. But how about truly preparing them for the next 100 years of uncertainty? We also need to bite the bullet and say, if we identify purposes that our current structures cannot handle, we need to create new ones. It's not just making eight faculties into four or renaming our faculties as colleges or any of those things. It's much more fundamental than that. Secondly, um, I think we should have another slide now. Uh, next one, please. Next one. Um, tradition, that was for the 100 years of universities. Purpose manners will serve us well if we move towards design thinking. So I think the first one, purpose, and then design. That's how you create good strategy. I believe that aspirational higher purposes beyond our individual missions will serve us well to knock down the bastions. By the way, it's no point in trying just a little bit harder. This a little bit harder won't do in the current climate. Maybe you could try galloping much faster along your ramparts on a driverless bus. This is the bus that inspires me. It's in Perth in Western Australia, where I've just come from. Try and think metaphor, driverless higher education perhaps. I like the driverless bus as an example because it has a much higher order in order to reduce the death and injury on our roads. Higher education needs to start reaching for the stars too. And then I think probably jobs of the future is another place we should look or perhaps an approach that really looks at professions of the future. I think another slide please. Yeah. Um, what kind of graduates sh should we be creating to tackle the major problems of the world throughout the 21st century? So what else might address it? Well, practical terms, we need to obsess with customer experience. This is what all those people do in all the other sectors using digital. It may sound obvious, but it is very hard to hear in, in universities because of our internal focus. By using design and user experience steps, including observation, rapid prototyping, to better understand customer needs and wants and desires, constantly solve problems and solutions, as well as create competitive advantage. That's how we leave to the long-term satisfaction of students that everyone's sitting at. Um, just another slide now, please, Daniel. Um, another one, please. Another one. 
Um, this is the university I'm at now. It, it is usually called the original, original red brick university. It's very campus based, very research intensive. But interestingly, on slide 15, you'll see it is managing to, next one please, to operate with nearly 10,000 entirely online students by partnering. So it can be done. Those kind of strategies can work with enough vision and enough resilience to carry it through. And that's one of the reasons why I've gone to Liverpool, because although it looks very traditional, there is something else going on that's knocking down the bastions. And this is one of them. You have to do things like this. You have to try it and you have to take some of the risks. So I know, Paul, I've got to finish. Yeah. <laughs> one more slide, please. And um, one more. What I suggest you do is focus on designing for the future. Your strategy should start with a much higher vision of what's going to happen to you in the next five to 10 years. It's time to get comfortable about being unsafe. Come down from the bastions. In this way, we will create education institutions that are successful in volatile, uncertain, complex and digital futures. Raise our responsibility for being more accountable, not for the back office, but for the future. And that's the way the bastion walls come down. And by the way, it's rather less about solutions and more about asking questions. So over to you colleagues, everyone in the room. Hope there's some little nugget in there that's rung true for each of you. Is higher education transformable, do you think? Or is it the final citadel of change in the knowledge world? Are you preparing for siege or building an escape route? Start new ventures, be brave, demolish the bastions and let all your people meet the onslaught directly. Thank you. Okay, we've time for at least one question to Julie. I'm sure we'll have more questions than that, but we've got a period at the end as well. So, um, Julie, you can probably see better than me from I there. Can the see. first hand that's raised is yours, so to speak. Be brave. Come on, hands, be brave. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll be besieged. No, they're still thinking about that. Anyone want to challenge? Open to challenge? No, I think we should move on, Paul. Okay, we'll move, 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 move <laughs> on. Never a bad thing to be ahead of time. Thank you very much, Jilly. Uh, okay. Now we move on to our, our final speaker of the three. Um, just let me uh, stand up and introduce him. Having felt besieged for the last uh, 15 minutes. Um, this, this presentation is intriguingly called Nordic Noir. Um, so... Um, we know a lot about Swedish now. I'm going to learn more about Nordic now, and all of us are. Beyond and behind the fingerprints of successful educational reform, I know a lot about unsuccessful educational reform, sometimes from bitter experience. So I'm, I think we're all looking to find out the fingerprints of successful educational reform. Um, Oli Pekka Pentinen is at the University of Helsinki. I have very warm feelings for that because they sent over a very pleasant research assistant uh, to me at the OU in 1996, and uh, just as I was leaving, but she came before I left. And so we had a very interesting six months analyzing the virtual universities of that era, those long lost eras. Uh, but there was still a lot going on in those days. So, uh, a great university. Um, Oli Pecker also says that he's brought up five children uh, to adulthood, which I, uh, uh, I think is impressive in, in itself. I brought up two and that was enough. Um, so, great, congratulations for that. Thank and you. we're all looking forward to hearing oh, your presentation. Thank you. thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's good to be here. Uh, I will talk about uh, uh, uncertainty and uh, change, and I will focus on on our our. Can I have a point? 
Yes, big wheel. It's a massive educational reform done in University of Helsinki during the last year. It takes one year and everything was changed there. And if you like to know something about the uncertainty and fear and everything, quite negative, contact me. I'm an expert on it. I'm also an expert in e-learning. I have done it maybe 16 years. I started in 201. One, and after that, I have a lot of projects and um, things related to developing uh, e-learning in our institution. But I will focus first on this result of the big wheel. It looks like that. So, after one year, the whole structure of the university was changed in a way that nowadays we have 32 bachelor program and now we have 32 master programs and uh, I belong to environment, environmental bachelor and EG, ECGS environmental change and global sustainability uh, master program. I'm a board member of both and I, I actively participate in the development of the teaching there and the red colors indicate the uh, environmental bachelor we have 60, 60 students present every year. We're taking 60 students every year. We have seven units that gives, gives education, but now they are put together. We have only one left. So seven departments were combined, and now we are giving the education for those 60 students. And they are working at two faculties. At the master level, ECGS, we have four four campus and five faculties are given to education for 90 students. Ten of them are internationals. And how does it sound like? When I was re preparing this slide, I was thinking about that. Why, 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 why we make a such a solution? It sounds so complicated. And the key word here is courage. I think that we have a lot of educational courage to do such a, such a big change. I'm, yes, truly. Otherwise, it, it would, otherwise we haven't succeeded. Uh, somebody called it stupidity. It's quite stupid to do such a big change, but we did it anyway. And now it started uh, four months ago. It takes one year to set up everything, and now we started to do it. And we are quite curious. We don't know yet what would happen. But I think that we are quite, quite brave to do such a big, big change. But then, then there's a special case in it's my own institute that is located 100 kilometers north of Helsinki in Lahti. So we, ha we had a department there, but then it was changed as an institution. Now it's part of the part of the environmental bachelor program and part of the uh, uh, research program called uh, environment and uh, ecosystems. So we are divided in a, in a uh, research, uh, research program and uh, bachelor and master programs. It's a, and our department will be disappeared after uh, 15 days at the end of this year. We don't have any longer departments, only faculties are left. And the location, Lahti University campus, it looks not so nice any longer. So we have one, only, only us are present there. Of course, there are some other universities, but they are not given education in such a way. We have a 10 academic person there, four professors and six university lecturers. And we are one of those seven uh, individual units that are now combined. Only problem is that we are away from Helsinki, from Viki campus or other campus areas. We are one of those four campuses, but we are 100 kilometers away. And we have these 60 students in, in, in bachelor program and 90 students in master program, but they are not there. We lost we lost our own students. Now we are all alone, only with the teachers there. 
And the question is that how we can survive. survive. In, in my opinion, it's a, it's a great survival game. How we can organize our education in a way that we, we can give, give our, our nice courses to the students that are now in Viikki or some other campuses of Helsinki. And that's a big question. But, yes, we have a dream. Yes. And uh, maybe you know that yesterday it was uh, our country's birthday. We are 100 years old now. And everybody probably celebrated, at least I was celebrating together with my children who is living here in Berlin. But we have a dream and a solution is digiloikka. I'm teaching you now, it's a time for the activity. I'm teaching you a one Finnish word, the most important word in our case, it's digiloikka. It means hop on, hop off from uh, digital education. Hop on, hop off. I'm not dancing, I'm not singing, but now I'm hopping. And now I ask you, stand up. We are doing it together. If you have your cellular phones, put the lights on. And Digi Loikka, I ask you, yes, somebody is it's working now. Uh, Digi Loikka, just I ask you, I, I, I count from three, and then jump up and say all together, Digi Loikka. One, Two, three, Digi Loikka! Oh, nice! <laughs> Thank you. So I have a dream that I can, uh, I can, I can create to exchange. Now we started here, now you can speak some word of Finnish already. And uh, let's see what happens. Digi Loikka is also a university level project. Uh, it's called Digiloikka, and it provides fund, funding for all the, all the new programs that are ready to develop digital education. And we already have received it to the uh, bachelor level. It's, the project has just, just finished, and we get, uh, get funding for the master level program to develop our digital education. And it's a top-down, clearly it, it was decided at the, at the higher level, it goes to the, goes, goes to the uh, faculties, it goes to the departments that are not existing any longer, and at the bottom-up we are ready to do it. The nicest thing here is that the, it really asked us to develop it. And although I have worked maybe 16 years in, in this e-learning issue, during the last six months, I have learned quite a lot of, of the e-learning, all those things. It has been excellent experience for me. We have had very nice projects all together, open-minded and work together, cooperation between different units. It has been very fruitful, and I think we have been quite successful. But now we will go, go, go back to the Lahti, but before that, Yes, something about uh, our plan. We have a master plan. If somebody was yesterday here in morning morning uh, workshop where we have this posted lab, you remember that the yellow means not so good, orange means uh, disaster, and red means the total disaster. So I didn't like the idea that my my slide somehow don't promise. Successful at least, but let's see. Now we go to the fingerprints. Uh, I was just thinking about that, how, how to describe fingerprints. But luckily, two weeks ago, Ministry of Education and Culture come to our our campus area to open our new 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 lecture rooms. Actually, we don't have any longer lecture rooms, but it changed it uh, multi-purpose purpose lecture hall that is very nice and there one of those fingerprints are truly the fingerprints of the minister of our education ministry of education and culture so if you go to the fingerprints one is that we have been long-term proactivity 
an adaptation to this coming situation. I can see the future. I, I was seeing it already 16 years ago. It takes a little bit longer, longer in Helsinki. Yes, we, were, we are not knocking on a heaven's door yet, but I think that quite soon. And we have had very slow, slow educational reform going on in Lahti in our department. We have had very fruitful atmosphere to the changes and all the time very active training, at least for me. Then we have, had, have, we have received quite a lot of support all the time from the university, faculty, department and our region and city of Lahti. We are, we are very grateful about it. Cooperation of, with the open university opened the doors for the national level education, actually international level education. And we are provide, providing quite a lot of e-learning courses for everybody, not only to our university, but also to the other, universe, one, other universities. Then we have this classroom reconstruction. We don't have any longer classrooms, it's logical because we don't have any students yet, because they are somewhere else. We have very full-scale video streaming system, so it means in practice that all the compulsory studies will be video streamed from Helsinki to Lahti and from Lahti to Helsinki. It works quite well. And students, originally they, were, they, were, they didn't like the idea, but after two weeks, a couple of students came to me and asked, that, is it possible to look at those videos at home instead of this lecture room? Then I said, yes, you can do it, but don't do it. But of course they do, and we, everybody, and it's a common, common thing, I think, that all the students disappear from the lecture rooms, and they, they went to home and look at the videos there. Not a good solution, I think, but it, they, they did it that way. And that's the, that's the challenge right now, how to, how to organize it. Because, we, of course, we wanted to have students also in the lecture rooms, at least in Helsinki. But, however, we have virtual students right now. And uh, I'm trying to develop this novel uh, student teach relationship. It's nice to, I don't know, to, right now I'm in a situation that I don't know the students, but they know me. And it's very odd that when, I, when, when I'm walking, for example, in Helsinki, somebody came, came to me and said, hi, Olli Pekka, I'm on your course, I love it, it's good. But I don't know who, who, who is she or he. But it's, it's working somehow, and I have a, I'm able to create a, a somehow some nice interaction between the student and teacher there. It seems to work. And the final slide. Yes, Moodle. We are using Moodle, Moodle in, in education. It seems to work. Uh, we, get the, we, we get the help with the pedagogy, pedag pedagogical sites and we are uh, trying to be a creative. It, it's, it's not the, probably the best platform, but it seems to work quite nice with us. We have model courses, we have, we have created a couple of model courses that you can just get the idea of how, how, what is the good way to give the e-learning in practice. We also just have created also whiteboard animation to just advertise, advertise the, uh, these courses for the other, other lectures at the university level. And they are just, just finished now. I just get a message today that now they are ready, but I'm not going to show it yet, but they are very nice. And then maybe this is not a, not a good thing, but the scaling problem of, of the, these e-learning courses is a problem or not problem. That means that uh, previously we, all, we, we have maybe 20 to 30 students per course, but nowadays Everybody wanted to come to our courses, and we are not un we are unable to take everybody to our courses for the reason that they are so popular now, and it seems to work. But the scale, we have to scale it somehow up, that we can take more and more students, and it's the next step in our our developing the whole whole system. So, thank you, sir. Are you going to sit down again? Yes, we. I'm going to sit down. <laughs> that was very interesting. Thank you. That was very good, and I'm glad everyone got a little practice in for those who are going to the party tonight. Um, mm. That will be useful. 
Um, <laughs> And I've been examining my fingers to see how the fingerprints are appearing. There's, there's, there's lots of questions uh, that we could ask. We may well elide from specific... Let's have specific questions to Aldi Pekka first. Um, and then we will gracefully elide into, into a more general discussion. I, I'm going to take pri Chairman's privilege and ask the first question because I know a little bit about the Finnish situation. Uh, Aldi Pekka said in passing, we just deliver courses to other universities. Now, that, that could sound very exciting in some countries, very horrifying in others. Could you just say a little bit more about that? And you also quickly mentioned in your slide the Finnish Open University, which not everyone may be familiar with in its current form. Could you just start by saying a little bit about the, the, more, the wider context and the links to the Open University and how you, how you do deliver courses elsewhere? Because some countries struggle with this concept. The Open University has a very active role, at least in a bachelor level. They wanted to, wanted to have more students and they, in this new situation, they are ready to invest to the bachelor level studies. And that's the reason why they are so interested in us. Because uh, the rule is that they can teach such a thing what, what we are teaching and it forced us to cooperate with them. Uh, Open University is very good in, in, in pedagogy and in technical issues. They are, they, are ready to, they, they are ready to help us and we have had extremely strong cooperation with them and I truly like it because it makes our life much, much more easy. But yes, their role is very active now in, in, in all the universities in Finland. Thank you. Okay, now we open it to the room, but let's please start with specific questions, but see how we go. Everyone's very, very quiet. Everyone's full of fingerprints. Ah, here we are, right, at the front. Helping out. Hi, I'm uh, Mikkel Smith. I'm from Denmark, and I would like to know what is it like to be a, a teacher, being Dutch, uh, te uh, 10 persons together up 100 kilometers from Helsinki. What do you see the future like? What does it do to your cooperation and stuff like this? Mm. I think the, this issue of our, our destiny in Lahti, that we are really worrying about it. And um, the fact is that we have tried to analyze that what is the, how, what is the target of us. And we have decided that we should focus on the master level only because during that time they, they, they will do the master thesis and that we are able to provide them excellent, excellent topics. And that's our idea, that sooner or later we will, I, I think that we will skip, skip the bachelor level and focus only the master level. That's our strategy. During the, maybe during the next three years, it's quite inevitable that we, we will focus on only master. Did that answer your question, really? Okay, fine. Um, next question. Okay, let's let's. Right there. Oh. oh, we have one. Where is? Oh, there. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm Jean-Marie Dumas from Tilburg University, in Netherlands. Um, I see, and of course, here we have a lot of vendors of software and everything. In many industries, uh, digitization brings the players to actually stop just using what others are developing, but to move toward developing their own solution. Because what digitalization does is that the value capture in a given industry go more and more to the technology provider and less and less to the other players. So you can look at retails and so others. The winners are the people who own the technology, not the people who use it. And people who are just using after some time lose relevance. Mm. So uh, I don't see, I, I, we are speaking here about strategies of institutions. And uh, well, I don't see many institutions actually trying to not just use products, but say, okay, we have the core of what makes the future, which is the user base, okay? How can you develop a great product is if you have the people that are going to use it are, are the core. And universities have professors and students, yes? 
but then we buy stuff from other people. And uh, there is something I think on the long term is not going to work because knowledge is a mobile uh, resource, okay? So at some point, the technology provider can buy the knowledge. So uh, this is really something I don't hear. I hear all about using what others are doing, having good ideas, sometimes co-developing, which I think may be a solution, but very little. So what do you think about this? Let me just check. I think this is a question for all, yes. all the speakers. So let's, let's then move, move it out to, to that. That issue is absolutely fascinating. Uh, let's, uh, Ilona, would you like to start with that? And then yeah. Jilly and then Pekka, Oli Pekka again, of, of course, because I think everyone has different perspectives on this. Yeah, so an interesting question. Indeed, I think mm, it, it might be different from country to country, also how universities are founded and what sort of funding you have to develop, for instance, your own things, and if you have resources to do this. Uh, because, yes, we are the users, we are professors and we are students, but still your core, the core thing that you do is teaching and doing research. And if you were also to develop the software, for instance, which you could in some departments, like um, information sciences, for instance, um, this would be a complete change of what you are doing at the university. I don't, I could not tell that this would be meaningful to my own university, but I can see that it might be different from country to country, also depending on, on the relationship to the vendors. So for instance, in Germany, I think that the general attitude is that we would rather use open source software and adjust this to our own needs and not develop something from scratch. But I don't know, it will be interested to what you do in UK and, and, and in, in Norway, but in Finland, sorry. Jenny? Um, UK I'm or Australia? I'm not sure whether that was quite what you, you meant, but... Actually, I have to say, I'm not saying we are all going to be programmers. No. But we are going to own what we develop. So you may outsource, you may have programmers, okay. but then you decide what is the future and you have people programming. I'm not thinking necessarily it's one institution. We are all players all over the world and we realize to move toward digitization, we need partnership between yeah. institutions. Yeah. So but now we are just clients. That, that was going to be my response was a slightly different take that um, I think it's fairly, you know, essential that we, we, be, we all become much more purposeful and in that sense enables us to become better partners because if we're absolutely clear what our own mission and strategy is and our responsibilities are, um, which of course, you know, in a university is, is certainly teaching research and community or citizenship responsibilities, um, you know, and, and we're not mass, you know, technology providers. But then that puts the challenge in that we have to partner with technology providers who understand actually they have to be partners and not vendors and should not come to us assuming they already know what problems we're looking to solve. It needs to be a true partnership. And I think, I mean, across the digitalization, it's the obvious one, but that applies, uh, in my view, the success of universities going into the future will be their ability to partner in all sorts of ways, uh, not the least, and including with our technology providers. And that's something I've certainly, when I've been in positions of responsibility, um, and I'm doing it still, have tried to show how that can be done without losing any of the university's integrity, because that's what they're worried about. Whereas if the technology providers can come forward with that strong understanding, you know, don't come and tell me what you're going to do for me, come and tell me how we can work together. And then I think it will transform the sector. And I have to say that I've looked around the exhibition, and this is probably going to annoy sponsors and things now, but <laughs> I've looked around the exhibition and I can't see that happening. Not really at the moment. You know, it, every time I've, I, I spent this morning approaching the stand, trying to find out what, and I said, this is what we've got, this is what you can do with it. 
not, you know, what is it you're, you know, how can we partner with you to develop this? So the first one that says that to me, I'm in. Mm. Okay. <laughs> That's, that's for the vendors to ponder. <laughs> Oli Pecker, what, what about have, Finland? I have two examples. Of course, I truly like the e-learning, all those tools and things. But every day, every morning, I just think about by myself, that does it make any sense? I have to say that every time I have to think it quite critically. And I have a one nice example. Uh, on two months ago, our new professor started to work in, in Lahti. He came from Berlin Technical University, he's very clever, and he said that he will not use anything related to technology. He wanted to meet the students, he wanted to work with them, and he don't like the technology at all. And now we are a little bit in problem, because everybody, I suppose that everybody is ready to use it automatically, but it's not the case, since we are we are fighting against it all the time and somehow I think that we realize that it it's, do not make sense all the time. Of course we are here and we are supposed to love the technology and personally I'm doing it occasionally but sometimes I'm just thinking about that why. It's a critical question why and it works somehow somewhere and if time is good then it's okay but not always. Thank you. Um, I think we've time for another couple of questions before we, we need to finish. So, um, any questions for any or, or all of the speakers from further back? Everyone at There's further back seems here. very There's quiet. One. Someone, oh, right, okay, the front row is really, really very questioning today. <laughs> um, what, uh, well, I, I was thinking uh, that uh, I. I I come, I visit the online Erika since 2003, and every year I hear that uh, schools and universities uh, that they uh, uh, are not willing to change, uh, but still I don't see that uh, universities and uh, University for Applied Sciences that they get punished because they don't change, and I was wondering why is this? Maybe because the system we have. Pretty good, pretty well works, but uh, so so maybe I want want you to to reflect on that. Can we can we really uh, uh, compare our uh, educational institutes with companies who uh, have to uh, innovate with digital technology uh, to survive in our society? Maybe maybe uh, universities, maybe schools are a quite different kind of uh, a sector that. Uh, maybe they, ca they can uh, reluct the influence of digital technology. That's a hard one. Who'd like to start? Um, well, well, I think you're right. Although, the, the, and of course, they are changing constantly. You know, there's, there's a huge range of small incremental changes. Um, and also, we're extremely good at the defense part, as I tried to explain in my talk. However, it's time is, is also part of context. It doesn't mean to say we will be all right next year or the year after, nor that, does it mean that we are serving our students in the best possible way that we could do. Um, so I think, for, you know, your observation is right that not anybody much has gone to the wall yet um, and therefore there's not that true driver. Um, but it could be about to all happen. These things get some sort of momentum and it could still happen. But my own feeling is that we should be doing it in order to ensure, you know, education of the future rather than simply because we might stop to exist as an organization. So the, the, the bottom line is different, isn't it? You know, what motivates us is different from what is essential in a business. Yeah. Any other comments? Yeah, so I agree. I would say that um, we can all see that there are changes happening mm. and they are maybe not radical changes like <laughs> we would wish sometime, you know, we would put everything upside down in a, in a week or <laughs> it just takes a lot of time. But 
yeah, that's a different, a different culture, a different, the different structures, but still changes are happening. And I think also because the generations also change. So for instance, what I can see at my own university with new generations, for instance, of professors, there's, there are also new ideas coming in. And um, it might be also this, this type of issues that are, for instance, preventing some universities from progressing quickly. Because I think there is changing happening everywhere. Maybe not in every hook and corner, but at every university there is some change, at least partially in some departments. And there are new media being used, maybe not strategically and maybe not as mainstream, but there's... There's a lot of activity, actually, I would say. And also what is interesting is that there are new universities coming up that have digital already in their, in their business model, so to mm. say, in quotation marks, which is also interesting to see and might be a very good example for traditional universities to, to take as an example and to see how things can be done differently. Yes, I think we have to see the future. But somehow I feel that, at least partly, we are exactly mentally at the same situation than we were 16 years ago. We are, the same arguments are still given when uh, 16 years ago it was really hard to start the e-learning, but still it, I feel that still somebody is saying the same arguments against it. So I feel odd in a way. Yeah. <laughs> it's not fair. No, of it's not fair. <laughs> it is mysterious though. Uh, so I think, you know, I tried to say in my talk that, you know, we kind of know that, you know, we've got to deal with this, but it's much easier to strategize if you can identify the causation. And I don't think we've got all of that yet. So I think, I think you're right. Yeah. In our university, we have decided that it has to be not it, it not has to be done by individuals, but it has to focus the whole whole program has to create the change. Otherwise, it would not work. So we have given the ex we have models of exchange change, but the program itself has to create something new now, and we are doing it together. And I think it's a power, powerful tool to operate together. Cooperation is one solution for for the hold this problem. Okay. I think that's a very good note on, on which to stop. So we will stop just slightly early, another radical, radical departure from the usual practice. Uh, I think we should give a special thanks to our speakers, and Oli Pekka in particular for being the closing speaker, and thank you, the audience, and um, now have a quick coffee break. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you.